to do to raise awareness uh, regarding the role of women uh, when we work in the political space and in society. Women equate half of humanity, but many where the breach is still visible. So we're going to be talking with the coordinator of with the coordinator of the Territorial Women in Mesoamerica, Tinta, and the Writing Resources Initiative. We're going to be talking about the importance of investing in Mesoamerican women and how investing in them accelerates progress. Women are facing a lot of limitation and they play an important role in agricultural production. They are most vulnerable when financing is decreased. And the coordinator of Territorial Women Leader promotes what we're wor working for them and their communities. Omaira Bolaños is with us. She'll be talking about the importance of women's situation right now. We also be joined by Candida Derek, Ana Patricia Ortiz, and Patricia Lopez. Uh, we'd like to remind each participant that they'll have 10 minutes for giving us their point of view. Uh, everyone is invited to, to write questions in the chat and the Q&A section. And we'll be looking for the interaction. I am Fatima Aguado, and I'd like to thank the coordinator of Territorial Women Leader of Mesoamerica and Tinta to invite me to be the, for inviting me to be the moderator of this space. Uh, our first participant will be Omaira Bolaños. Um, she is she's coming from Rise and Resources Initiative. She's a PhD. She is an assessing member of a Legal Rights Council. Uh, she's also part of Rivers with Rights. Omari has over 25 years of professional experience working with indigenous peoples and local communities. Also, Rivers Gender community-based projects, applied research, and capacity development. She's been researching regarding the fight of territorial rights of indigenous people's rights in the Amazon. In the last 10 years, in the Rights and Resources Initiative, she's been working in prioritizing and supporting the Afro-descended movement in Latin America. She's with RRI since 2009. Go ahead, Omaira. Fatima, thank you very much. Um, in the first place, I'd love to thank the coordinator of Territorial Women Leaders in Mesoamerica. I'd like to thank also Tinta, AMPB, and all the other organizations that are supporting us today. I'd like to share with you a presentation for looking into the context of land tenure rights and how that reflects in women. So I'll be sharing with you this presentation. Uh, could you please uh, let me know if you are seeing my screen? So, um, why is it fundamental that there's a dedicated funding to indigenous women? So, I'd like to give a broader overview. RRI supports all the IPOC movements, and especially women regarding to land tenure rights. 
So I'd like to talk about who owns the land. This is a study started last year. And right now we're sharing our findings. Uh, it was done in 85 countries. So it's around 85% of the world surface. And we're analyzing the changes from 2015 to 2020. Um, within the countries that have been analyzed are six Latin American countries. So we'd like to see who owns the land in Mesoamerica and South America. So in the last five years, only 1.1% of land surface increased when we're talking about lands assigned to indigenous peoples, communi local communities, and Afro-descendant. So that's really low, taking into account that there's a lot of demand regarding recognizing the land tenure rights of IPLCs. Mesoamerica, it's a really essential area for climate change because a lot of forests are located there. And in this aspect, we have only increased 0 0.5 in recognizing these land chain rights. So compared to Asia and Africa, the process has stagnated. Um, definitely, you can look into this data um, afterwards and access to all the other documentation I've been quoting. We have also um, we're talking about the Caribbean is where there's more density of Afro-descendant people a little bit over 100 million, 150 million people, according to Cepal and FAO. So we've seen that there's 205 million hectares managed by Afro-descendant people, but only 5% of them have been legally acknowledged. So there's a lot of insecurity regarding this land tenure for example, Colombia, Brazil, Nicaragua, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Honduras, they have started these process to acknowledge land tenure. So what does this mean regarding women's rights? So I'd like to share with you uh, what we've done, uh, our results from a 2017 study. So how are women's rights regarding length tenure are represented here? The first thing that has been identified is that we have analyzed 30 countries uh, right now, we're working also in three additional countries. So now we're working on 33 countries. So in Latin America, countries are offering more protection for the inheritance rights, especially when we're talking about daughters, widows, single women. But when we look at it, we're falling behind Africa and Asia regarding property rights. So for inheritance, we're doing well, but overall in property rights, we're falling behind also regarding acknowledging the leadership of women when we're talking about so women are not being acknowledged as members of the communities so they're not going to be acknowledged as leaders nonetheless however they are acknowledging right now the right to belong to a community. 
So being part of the community is part of it. That's essential. But we need to use this to position more rights for women. Nicaragua definitely affirms the, the right of women to have property, even if they're indigenous women, for example. We have a right when it comes to right for Afro-descendant women, we can see these bars right now. So the first three one, constitutional protection to equality, uh, property rights and inheritance are the legal framework that cover all women, women from the cities, from the country, indigenous women, Afro-descendant. So we're moving forward regarding this overall legal framework. But then if we look into it, the rights of indigenous women, local community women, and Afro-descendant women, where we're starting to see these collective rights of tenure, we're falling behind. Even if we're moving forward, women's rights in this context are not being defined specifically. For example, when we're talking about belonging to a community, voting, leadership, and this also reflects to conflict resolution. So in the legal framework that we have seen, the African women have some advantages. Um, we have done another study and we've been analyzing the challenges, barriers, and strategies of indigenous and Afro-descendant women for exercising their leadership. So we're studying which are the barriers that they're facing, all the limitations they're having. So some of these limitations are intersectional, So the idea is for them to have access to resources, but also we're looking into how are the traditional processes for land tenure. Uh, we're looking into access to education, technology, and technical knowledge. So it's necessary for women to acknowledge that they have equal rights and how they can exercise them because there is a gender gap. Also, there are strategies around women so that they can be seen as leadership. We're talking about learning processes, um, having a community-based organization has been essential for them to expand their leadership. So we need another recommendation is to raise awareness regarding women's role and what they've been doing regarding preservation, climate change, security, independence, of food security, regarding local economy as well. So we're working around this. So we're also working on a more focused analysis to see how they're initiatives are supporting communities and the results that we've seen um, right now for this study are based in Colombia and Peru. So they're generating employ employment, they're creating jobs, even if they're informal or temporary, they're contributing not just to their families, but to the community. Being economic independent, these creates revenue, they're becoming more financially autonomous, and they're contributing to developing their communities. Having economical empowerment, they create solidarity networks, they're contributing to their leadership, and they're contributing to create more knowledge and competence for women in different fields. And right in this way, women is seen different regarding community participation. They're becoming leaders. So 
but is there financing to support women? This is the key question. And what we found on a general level is that there's a gap in the information about what financing actually reaches women. Generally, only one of every $100 destined to gender equality actually reaches feminist organizations around the world. And this is just generally speaking. And with relation to indigenous people who represent 6.2% of the world population, they only receive 0.4% of philanthropy, which comes from the United States. So here we can see what problems are occurring. And when we begin to look in detail about financing for indigenous people, the indigenous women and local communities, there is hardly any data, which means that we haven't worked on this. It isn't possible to find this information. And over recent years, donors have wanted to channel more climate funding to indigenous peoples. And an initial investigation found that only 27% of that funding actually mentioned the word gender, but it isn't clear whether this funding is reaching women or not. So what can we do to change this? And we'll talk a bit about the actions that women are carrying out. For example, in Mesoamerica, we have the Alliance of Women in the Global South. This is an alliance of women in Latin America of African descent, and it formed two years ago to generate collective strength to incite governments, donors, and international allies to have better climate financing and financing for women. And this is a unique alliance because it brings the voices and perspectives of women. And this can benefit the activities which are being carried out, which will benefit peoples and communities more generally. This alliance has generated a call to action to find ways to make funding accessible to women, to make funding more inclusive uh, for the global south. And as part of this process, we really need to show data, especially data about the financing which is reaching women. At the moment, at the RRI and in alliance with the Women of the South Alliance, we're going to try to find out what funding is is reaching us. We're going to have an analysis from the ground up to see what is reaching us on the ground. This is something that we want to do to strengthen our work and see how financing can reach women directly and contribute to the work that we're carrying out so far. Thank you. Thank you, Omaira, for showing us your whole journey in this investigation process. It's extremely important to collect data and statistics with a perspective of gender and the environment. And it's also important to ensure that this information is incorporated into global climate discussions and incorporated into policy making in both the public and the private sector. This needs to be based on all of this evidence. According to the UN, one of the main obstacles to having gender equality is a lack in financing. And women only receive 1% of this. And it's women who are leading the fight against poverty and inequality. That's why grassroots organizations are extremely important. And they can defend women's rights and be spokespeople for women.
How do you think that donors can improve to close this disequality, this inequality? You're muted. I think that we need a two-sided effort, and that's what I've been trying to show up until now. Uh, firstly, for uh, bilateral donors, governments, allies, and philanthropists to be able to understand, we need to make them understand that it's important to assign funding specifically to women. When we work with people and communities, we need to understand that there is a, a gap and there are structural processes of discrimination against women who, unfortunately, in some cases, are treated as natural forces. But these gaps need to be understood from a point of view of philanthropy and support. So we can know that even if funding is promised to communities, we need to have specific funding for women inside these groups so that they can work and contribute to the process. That's the first element. And from the ground up, a good example is what the women of the Alliance of Global South are doing. They're creating a strategy and they're specifically showing what types of obstacles women have to access funding and what we need to improve, not just in the architecture, financing, what we need to change to be more flexible, uh, to arrive more easily, to give more information about funding, but what type of training, what type of capacity building do we need for organizations and groups to be able to receive funding. We need to be able to generate a dialogue from the from bottom up and from top down. So a funding which has general aims such as conservation or climate change or development also has a line of dialogue so they can see what women on the ground are fighting for to access their rights and how this funding can be directed to those local processes. We worked with women of the Alliance in the Global South to exchange knowledge and strategies, and we found that women had been doing lots of intergenerational training, leadership jobs. They'd been generating care protocols, protocols to avoid uh, generalized violence against women, uh, violence uh, between families and communities from the state and the private sector. But these processes haven't received support. Generally, financing is defined as broad packages, which uh, talks about, by example, in terms of biodiversity, climate change, conservation, but all of the things that have to do with rights and leadership, training, and being able to access and choose resources, sometimes these things aren't taken into account. So that's why these large financing packages need to be more diversified internally so we can identify the different needs and initiatives that women are carrying out and that they're currently contributing to. We've seen on a global level that when there are indigenous people and local communities and people of African descent, there's a lot of biodiversity and this is normally protected because women play an essential role in this part of 
of transmitting uh, traditional knowledge more specifically. So we need to open up a more aware dialogue and talk about how we can increase our capacity to manage this. Thank you for participating. It's very clear that only actions that involve all actors and participants will close the financing gap in women's rights and achieve this gender equality that is so sought after. Thank you, Almeida. We have a second guest. She is president of the uh, indigenous women. She works in healthcare in the Miquito population and in the Territorial Council. Uh, and remember that you can write any questions in the chat box. Off you go, you have the floor. Welcome. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. I don't have access to the camera. We, we do see you, Candida. Oh, okay. Perfect. I would like to send very warm wishes to everyone on this very special International Women's Day. I'm Candida Derek. I'm from uh, Honduras. And on such a special day, I would like to share with each of you a sad reality that women and wives experience. You can listen to and perhaps identify with a summary that I'll give to help identify how climate change is having an impact. Before I begin, I would just like to talk about life in Honduras. In Honduras, there aren't jobs. Nevertheless, young people begin to work in diving. When divers begin to dive for langoustines, the young people will wait on the boat. And then when they learn a bit more, they'll begin to dive themselves. And what impact does climate change have here? In the past, divers would find langoustines in a certain area of the sea, not so far away from the land. It would be close to the land and it wouldn't be so deep. But because of climate change, langoustines and seafood is now further away from the land and they're deeper into the sea. So the diver has to dive to a deeper depth than normal. And because of the situation, divers have problems with air compression. And this process will last for 15 days. The boats will reach the Mezquita people, they'll find a diver and give them money. The divers will give the money to their wives and they'll find Langsteins to earn a living. And some divers arrive home safely, but many of them arrive home with problems due to the pressure. And 
solamente eh, uno en Puerto Lempira. Para que pueda recibir lo que es la cámara hiperbárica, una pronta, un pronto tratamiento. Pero muchos de los dueños de los botes se esperan, Me... completar su trabajo, o se esperan 15 días para llevarlo al buzo o la cámara hiperbárica. Many of the, the managers of the boats will wait for the 15-day shift to end before they take divers in need to the hospital, and often these divers won't be able to recover properly from the pressure problems. They don't receive help from the government or any NGOs. So what happens for the women? This is a, a difficult situation for them to tackle. It's a serious problem, a heavy burden, because many women don't have a salary. Sometimes they don't even have housing. They don't have possessions. Many of them are illiterate. They live in extreme poverty. As some of them live in isolation. For the wives or partners of these divers, it's very difficult to deal with the topic because they also they have to deal with many aspects such as the family, the economy, mental health, because they have to look after a disabled husband who's maybe in a wheelchair. They have to care for their husband and their children. Sometimes they'll also have to look after parents or parents-in-law. So what happens in this situation? The woman has a very heavy burden in her family and she can't fulfill it. And often this means that the children won't be able to go to school because their mother won't have enough money to buy them a uniform, shoes, books and pens. And the children will end up in a vicious circle. They'll do the same thing that their father did. They'll begin off in the boats, then they'll start diving. And then unfortunately, they'll have the same problems with lung pressure. It's a vicious cycle. There are some women they have a burden and given the extreme poverty of such difficult situations some men will take advantage of the naiveness of young children and leave them pregnant and then a child will be left bringing up another child and what these women are going through is terrible today we're celebrating a special day international women's day but i'd like to give a call to everyone here just reflect if we were in the place of these women, the, these wives of the divers, what would we do? I feel this burden like a cross. It's the heaviest burden that the women are living. These wives of the divers. And this is sad and unacceptable that these women don't have the support of anyone, not even their own families, because their families don't have anything to give them. There's no governmental organization that provides for these women. There's no government worrying about these women. So poverty turns into extreme poverty. That's why I would love for you to analyze this. It's really good to analyze and to think about these things. It's really 
impressive to see how the lives of these women change. Everyone speaks about climate change, but we are not aware of how it impacts women, especially these women that I've been talking about. So today, I would love for you to think about them. All of you that are analyzing the situation, think of them. What can we do for helping these women? We need territorial fund. We need maybe a job opportunity for the partners of these disabled men. The situation is becoming more complex. What happens if they die? They don't have money for the funeral. The situation is really sad. And all of this is due to climate change. And climate change will keep going on. And the changes it brings as well. That's why I would love for you to analyze the situation and help us to help these women. Candida, thank you very much for sharing all of this. And definitely this brings us to the topic that we need to close this gap. All these girls are women facing a lot of obstacles to leave poverty behind, especially when you're an indigenous or afro descendant women. You're facing different ways of violence and discrimination. Um, I don't know if anyone has a question right now. I don't, I'm not seeing any right now in the chat, but I don't know if someone wants to say anything about what we've just heard. If not, we'll be moving forward with our second guest, Ana Patricia Ortiz. She is a graduate and master in economy. She has a lot of empathy, which has led her to walk to work with communities in Northwest Mexico. These are marginalized communities and she's looking forward to strengthening their capacities because she's convinced that each person can has their development. She's also specialized in restoration of soil and water and right now is the president of the Civil Association of Multiple Services for Agribusiness development. Welcome, Ana Patricia. The floor is yours. Morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to give you a hug, even if it's a virtual one. I'm really moved about what Candida just mentioned. We'll definitely need to look into our possibilities to see how we can support them. I'll definitely will be looking into this. It will be a homework and a duty for me because we need to work together and we need to support each other and we need to support Candida. So I'm located in northern Mexico, and we had the chance to be beneficiaries from RRI. Uh, so this is a project working with women who produce goat sheets. Um, this picture we can see um, that we start to work before the sun rises. Um, zones are arid and semi-arid uh, because the days are really hot. Sometimes we can even get up to 45 degrees. So we need to take advantage of the early hours. Brutal families 
they have a mix of activities. They collect, um, they're like self-sustainable, and sometimes they also have cattle for having like extra income. However, now because of climate change, their livelihoods have been impacted because there have been extensive droughts. Um, the season for sowing has changed. So now agriculture is no longer profitable. They cannot even get back the production costs. Um, when it comes to the cattle, and livestock, um, they have been changing because especially uh, the cattle, we're saying that uh, they are eating 7 to 10% of their weight, so around 35 kilos. And so you can see uh, in the pictures that this has been scarce. As you can see on the left, there's not enough for fodder. And on the right, you can see how we get our water for all the animals. We're using ponds. Uh, these ponds are made by rainwater. So if there's no rain, these ponds are drying. And all the animals are losing their form and their condition, and then they die. As you can see in this image, this animal is growing thinner and thinner because it has no water. And in this one, you can see that animals. You can see here three dead cows. Next one, please. So facing this, for facing this situation and to mitigate climate change impact, um, what women have been doing is changing to goats. So for example, goats, uh, like they have 1.5 kilos of fodder. That's what they eat. And it's not just grasslands, but they also feed from bushes in the hills. So they have more to eat and a bigger surface for feeding themselves. So they're built to support in a better way climate change impact. Um, you can see on the left, um, a woman, sorry, in the right, you can see a woman with the goat and her husband is helping her milk the goat. So now they're creating and producing goat cheese. Uh, also, is more expensive than when you're doing from cow's milk. Also, thanks for the funding of RRR and AMPB through the coordinator of Territorial Women Leader. They have developed a better product. Right now, uh, they have a more homogeneous presentation and they're working together as a community offering their product. This funding helps to have greater resilience and they're funding and helping rural women who are the most vulnerable, especially when facing climate change impact. Here you can see uh, which are the organizations that have helped us with funding to develop these women's initiative. Right now, uh, we're seeing what's left for us. So we're going into the second stage to, and for this stage, we like to consolidate our labels, uh, vacuum packaging, some advertising as well, and to be formally organized in order to have invoicing and access different markets. Next, please. Uh, 
So Isabel was telling me that we could talk about why it's important to support women who fight climate change. And here you're seeing six reasons, but there are many more. Regarding efficiency, when a woman receives one peso or a dollar, she works miracles with them. Besides all the labor that's assigned to her, she's always will be doing an excellent job. It also empowers. The first panelist already gave us a lot of insights regarding this. But when you support women, you're really empowering them. Social justice, that also gives them more resilience. Women are really excellent regarding facing and being resilient to climate change. With this project, they're going to stay in their lands and they're going to be resilient facing climate change. We're seeing how they were able to adapt and move forward. It also has a multiplying effect. Because when you're supporting a woman, you're not supporting only that woman. You're supporting a whole family. So they're going to have a better nutrition. They're going to have higher access to education. Women can multiply whatever comes to our hands. It doesn't matter what type of support they're receiving, even if it's like specific one, not just monetary one. And finally, women have special sensibility. We are life givers, so we're connected to Mother Earth. Next, please. Uh, if you can hit enter. Thank you. I think I've reached up my time. So there's still much to do, but we're, what we believe we're going in the right way. Thank you very much. Um, remember, we're located in the north of Mexico. Thanks a lot, Ana Patricia. Thank you for sharing your experience. We know that climate policies do not help as much as needed girls and women because we cannot divide women from girls. So we need to understand how gender and the environment are related. And we need to understand that women are change agents and they're really essential for the communities and climate change. Women play an essential role for biodiversity. They transfer ancestral knowledge and then can strengthen resilience and create sustainable solutions. Here we have a question. How can we strengthen the active participation of women in their territories for keeping their cultural integrity and the economic one as well within your communities? Well, I think that is supporting these type of initiatives. We need to support these initiatives that come up from the territorial communities. Sometimes we'd like to support women, but we're looking for like the huge and big initiatives, like the greatest innovation, but we don't realize that actually that in the small and important changes, this is the place where we can have an impact. We need to actively listen to women, respect them, support their ideas and projects, because their development can be done without leaving their communities. They're going to be strengthening the roots. They're be maximizing their ancestral knowledge. And these projects are related and linked when their territory with natural resources, because women will always be in harmony with mother nature. If you have any additional questions, here we are. 
Thanks a lot, Ana Patricia. Um, there are no other questions in the chat, so we'll be moving forward with our third panelist, Irma Consuelo Lopez Esquivel. She's a housewife, a single, single mother of five. She's a community leader, and she's faced different challenges when facing violin. She has two medals in voluntary participation in the National Office of Women. She has 22 specializations of 14 artisanal entrepreneurships. She also the owner of her own business. She belongs to the Community Council of Rural Development. She's also second to the Association of Petén Communities. She's working at Anarim as a community instructor, sharing her experience and supporting other women. Welcome, Irma Consuelo. The floor is yours. Hi, can you hear me? Good morning, everyone. Are you hearing me? Great. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity of sharing my experience. So when we started, I was 13, now I'm 43. So back then I was working, holding my mother's hand. I was seeing how they wanted to organize themselves, thinking about what can we do? How can we work? without having an impact in natural resources, the animals and the forest, human life as well. And how to leave poverty behind. I remember quite well, even if I was only 13, that we were not sitting on chairs, we were sitting on the floor uh, because we have no place to gather. So with the Forest Community Association of Petén, they starting to um, give us training. And then we had like a small startup. And we started working with Ramon Seeds product. This is a natural resource that we can find in the forest is Maya tree. We collect the seeds, then we dehydrate them. And we also select um, to ground them, to pack them, label them. And um, well, I need to say like uh, the process of dehydrating these seeds is natural. Uh, our town has been uh, victim of violence, for example, intrafamiliar violence. So when I started participating in this project, my husband was telling me, no, you cannot do this. What will happen with our household, the children? And I was afraid that one day he might leave me. So I said yes to all of his requests. But in the end, he left me. He left me with five children, so I continued participating. And thanks to this process, I've managed to move on. I have developed my skills. I have different business. As you mentioned, I'm a business owner. This year, my third son will graduate. And when I share this, I share it as an example for all the community women that are in a risk situation because they don't want to live this vicious circle that sometimes we find ourselves when we're married. And sometimes we don't know which are our rights as women. So something that has really helped me is to be empowered, to know my rights. And those were the rights that gave me my ideas and my initiatives and also being economically independent. Right now, I'm really pleased because I can take over um, my mom. 
Uh, God have her in her mercy. She's no longer here with me. So now I'm the one leading what she led. And I feel really glad and satisfied to be leading different women. And they're asking me, what's your game? What are you doing there? And my answer is that satisfaction comes from sharing my experience, sharing my life. And, and that all women can know my experience because they don't dare to do what they want to do because sometimes they're being bitten in their families and they don't want to leave that place, that situation. So that's my experience. I've shared it with you. And I'm really thankful to have the opportunity of doing so. Thank you. Thank you, Irma, for sharing your experience with us, your experience of violence. We know this is a very hard cycle to break. And I'm sure we need this financing to for women's organizations to, to work and to see what the best way is to achieve gender equality and how we can make decisions. We have two questions in the chat. The first is, what are the limitations that women have to access to natural resources, such as earth, forests, wood, considering they have a lot of experience with everything that has to do with this? You're on mute. Uh, the first is a lack of independence. If women have limitations, it's because of inequality, uh, unequal distribution in access to natural resources, earth, housing, and financing. But this has been changing. We're moving forward, we're making a change, but we do still have limitations, such as the amount of uh, requirements that's placed on us as community women. We have to have a, a legal association because if it isn't legal, then it can't receive this financing. And then we have to turn to other organizations or associations which are legal. And this is a lot of up and down and a lot of costs which aren't included in the financing. So those are the biggest difficulties that we have at the moment as organized women. Uh, thank you, Irma. Someone has their hand up. So we can give them the floor now. Um, maybe not any more. Are there any other questions for any of the panelists that you'd like an answer to? Here we have a question. How do we commercialize products in a community? Um, in my case with the cheeses, They make very good cheese. So they go to the communities. And they're called coyotes, the, intim, the, the middlemen. But they're paid a very low price. So the idea is for us to be able to be on the market with our own brand with a better presentation. So the money earns, ends up in the women's pockets because this, the middleman takes almost double the price. But we still haven't reached this next step. Nevertheless, we're very excited about the sports. 
we're very hopeful and we hope that before too long we'll have places where we can commercialize which will be as good as any shop we just need to make sure we're in compliance with the health board with the barcodes and the pasteurized milk but the main thing is that we're working and we're taking action thank you thank you we can give the floor to marisol carlson Away you go, Marisol. Marisol, you have the floor. Can anyone help us to get Marisol access to the mic? Ah, it would seem the participants can't turn their microphones on. So maybe Marisol could write in the chat. Buenos dias. Good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Uh, good morning and congratulations to everyone today on Women's Day. I just wanted to talk about our sister Candida's presentation from Honduras. I'm Marisol, I'm from Nicaragua and Candida is from Honduras. So we're quite close by and the situation of the the divers the wives and the children is just the same in nicaragua or maybe even worse as what candida told us about the constant deaths that we've been seeing recently but now young people are taking action. In Nicaragua as well, the divers are having to go very far away from the land. They're spending hours out at sea. And that's why women are ending up without any support because any deaths that occur aren't compensated by companies. So in Nicaragua and in Honduras, the women are having to deal with these problems without any support. It's the same in both countries. So I just wanted to mention that because Candida has, uh, has mentioned it in Honduras and Nicaragua is the same or is worse because 
Young people are losing their lives under the water or when they come out of the water. And this causes big problems for their wives and for their children. And these people can sometimes even be minors. Thank you. If anyone else would like to participate, put your hand up and we can enable your microphone. In the meantime, at the AMPB, we still believe it's important for women to be represented in different spaces. We need coordination in many areas, such as disaster risk reduction in local, regional, national, and international situations. That's what we've been working on. So the a territorial leader has drawn up a gender and climate change participatory plan. We're going to share an image with a QR code so you can scan that and read the regional plan, which is a tool to set the lay the foundations of multi level dialogue, which will allow women to find solutions, sustainable development solutions, which are equitable. Women deserve and will keep claiming their space at dialogue tables. This plan is in English and in Spanish, so you can download it and share it with your networks and strategic allies and donors. The floor is open in case anyone wants to make any comments or ask any questions. We have someone with a hand up. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for this space. And thank you to Candida for talking about all of the effort that's being made to talk about what we're seeing in our communities. I would like to thank everyone for everything they've shared. It's been very enriching. And I would like to thank you for this effort to construct financing mechanisms which are built from the ground up. I think that all of the experiences that you've shared have been very useful. And these are elements that help us to better define and understand how different financing needs to be for communities and how much more emphasis it needs to have on women. So I would like to thank you for being courageous and sharing information today. And I would like to thank all of our sisters for being present and congratulate everyone for this International Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah, for your comments. We also have Amalia Hernandez. You have the floor, Amalia. Can you hear me? Good morning. Good morning, Amalia. Firstly, I would like to congratulate all of my female colleagues that have been leading different processes, but which are all focused on the same thing, on nature, on Mother Earth. And I know that we're all part of this. We're all part of helping our planet and everything that we've done is related. How can I word it? 
I would like to work, continue working with women and women leaders. I think this is very important because we need to train up female leaders and inform women so that processes don't stop halfway or so processes don't have to begin again from scratch because For example, I think we need to prepare women better so the things that we do aren't in vain. It's very important to train up women leaders. Thank you, Amalia. Women do have an important important and relevant role, and we need to keep strengthening that. Good morning. I am very thankful to have met each and every one of you because you are very hard women and very hard working and entrepreneurial women and you're very willing to share. I wanted to talk about financing for women and groups of women. If in a society, in a world where we really can make process and reach equality, we need financing to be towards women and for women and with proposals made based on the realities of each woman and each group of women. We can't be finding solutions from behind a desk in an office. The voice of women needs to truly be reflected in the proposals made in the financing proposed but from a vision of women and their needs in their environment. We can't imagine development without this access of financing for women. Thank you. And I send wishes to you all. Thank you, Guadalupe, for this important comment. And question and and reflection on listening to women's voices, to draw up projects in which their participation is vital. So go ahead and hand can We also will be enabling. Andrea Rodriguez on mic. Okay, it was um, this was not a purpose, it was an accident, she raised her hand. Okay, anyone else wanting to say anything? We have around five more minutes, I believe. We also have the gender and climate change plan. Um, we're sharing it, so you can read it, share it, we can implement it. This proposal was built based on women's voices. Uh, this is from IMPV and uh, for the coordinator of territorial women leader, it's a political agenda for doing advocacy on topics that impact women. Um, 
if we don't have anyone else that wants to take the floor, we'll start to wrap up our webinar. Um, the only additional thing we'd like to say is please follow us on social media. And we'll be closing that with this sentence. For transforming societies, it's essential to increase funding, funding for policies that impact gender equality policies. We need to promote economic independence of women and that we can go towards a more sustainable, fair world. Thank you so much to the coordinator of Territorial Women Leader. And also would like to thank all the men that support our initiatives and that believe in equality and same rights for men and women. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here with us. Have an amazing day. Um, also, we'd like to highlight that we have uh, a comms campaign. We'll be launching it and we'll be showing eight different stories from Mesoamerican women. That's why also the invitation to follow us on social media. Have a lovely day and an amazing weekend. Thank you, everyone.